let you know that someone came before me. I asked someone to come and speak to everybody here tonight. So I'm going to ask you all to welcome Denise. Hi, everyone. As Joe said, my name is Denise. I have a story to tell you. It's my son's story. Um, he couldn't be here tonight to tell it, so I'm here to tell it for him. In February 2010, my son came to me and said, Mom, I have a problem with prescription drugs. I didn't see it coming. I said, okay, we'll get you some help. And we did. Part of me was not so taken back because I said, oh, they're not real drugs. They're prescription drugs. They're not cocaine. They're not heroin. They're just, well, doctor writes them out. They're prescriptions. They can't be that bad. So I wasn't as devastated as I should have been. But we got him the help that he needed. And he was clean for a while. Then he came to me again. And he said, Mom, I'm back on the pills. Now, since then, I'm realizing that these pills are just as bad as regular drugs. I'm seeing my son go from a very well-kept, very clean, um, articulate man to a dirty, unkept, sloppy, not nice person. He was usually very loving to me, very kind. Um, by now he had lost his job. He told me that his job was moving and that they were downsizing. It turned out to be a lie. His boss gave him two, two shots of him falling asleep at, the, at his desk, and the third shot he was out. Then I started to get complaints from my family members that he went by my sister's house, he brought money from her house. He went to my mother's house. My mother called me up and said, painkillers are missing from my bathroom. He was stopping by relatives' houses that he never went by and using their bathroom. I knew I was in trouble. I called Joe. Joe told me things I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to believe. He said to me, your son is a ticking time bomb. He could OD any minute. I said, no, Joe, I think you're wrong. He's not that bad. He said, no, he is that bad. But I didn't want to believe it. My husband and I were fighting day and night because living in my house was a living hell. My son was nodding out at the dinner table. He was tripping over his own feet. He was starting fights and going on rampages for no reason at all. And we tried to hide it from people. So I would lie and tell my family members I was ill, or that somebody was sick not to come over, or just to stay away from people, because I didn't want them to see what was going on in the house. And um, I started noticing all my money gone. Little by little, all my money was gone from my wallet. I would say to my husband, did you go in my bag? Did you go in my daughter, did you go in my bag? Did you go in my son, did you go in my bag? Nobody went in my bag, but my money was gone. Jewelry was missing. People started ringing my doorbell in the middle of the night looking for my son. I called Joe. He said to me, you have a very big problem on your hands. He needs to go away. Now, he was 22 at the time, so I couldn't put him away. The best I could do was beg him to go away. I said, 
get you some get get yourself some help. Let me get you the help that you need. So we went to an NA an NA meeting. But she sat back and laughed the entire time. He says, These people are drug addicts. I'm not a drug addict. I just take a pill here and there. I said, No, you're a drug addict. He said, No, I'm not. I'm not a drug addict, Mom. These are people that shoot heroin. I don't shoot heroin. I take a pill here and there. I said, no, you don't. You're high all the time. And I can't live like this anymore. And it's going to kill you. He said, no, it's not. It's not going to kill me. And I set up an intervention with Joe. And a family member who thought he was doing my son a big favor told him. And my son took off. And he was gone for a few days. The day he came home, he was higher than I had ever seen him in his entire life. He was pale as a ghost. He was sweating profusely. He was falling asleep while I was talking to him. He was dropping things. He was drooling. sell the house. Just tell me what you need to get you the help you need. Because I can't live without you. He said to me, I know, Mom. I know you can't live without me. But I don't know what to do. I said, well, let me help you. He says, no, I could stop this on my own. I said, you can't, though. He says, I can. I said, you can't. He says, it's not as bad as you think. I said, I know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a different person. I said to him, when was the last time you showered? He says, what, is, what does that mean? I said, look at you. You're a mess. He said to me, as your son, I'm looking you straight, straight in the eye and I'm telling you, I don't have a drug problem. I beg you to believe me. I beg you to believe me. As your son, believe me. I wouldn't lie to you. And he was very offended that I didn't believe him. I said to him, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. He said to me, we don't lie to each other. I said, you didn't used to lie to each other. You do now. You lie to me all the time. He says, no, I, I, I don't, and I'm not lying to you now. And we had a very bad fight on a Monday night. And he was trying to talk to me, but he kept falling asleep while he was speaking. And as he was standing, he kept falling over his feet. I said to him, I'm not going to have this conversation with you. With you this high, because you won't even remember it in the morning. We have to come up with some sort of a plan. You have to go somewhere. You have to go away. Otherwise, you're going to die. He says, I'm not going to die. I'm just going to stop. You'll see. I said, I hope you're right, and I really hope I'm wrong. I don't think so. That night, he came up to my bedroom, my husband and myself, and him had a very good fight because he said, look what you're doing to your mother. Your mother is hysterical crying and you're trying to talk to her and you're falling all over the bed. You're falling all over the place. Your eyes are rolling in your head. You're drooling. You don't know what you're saying. Look at the example you're setting for your younger sister two younger brothers, younger sister, all the kids in the family. Look what you doing? He said, I'm going to straighten myself up. I'm going to get better. We'll talk in the morning. I said, OK. I said, whatever you did, sleep it off. If you're not going to let me help you, sleep it off. I went 
tell to the jour to him the next morning about our plan of attack, and he was dead. And I'm here because I don't want another mother to find what I found. My child covered in vomit, with foam coming out of his mouth, bleeding from his nose. As soon as I walked in his room, I looked at him and I knew he was dead. And all the promise, promises and everything he said, there was no more second chance. There was no more, what can I do for you? It was over. It was over. He died, it'll be three years on Saturday. For Christmas, I bought him a headstone. There's no more holidays in my house. We don't have holidays. Every day is a struggle just to get out of bed. And it doesn't end when they die and you're left behind to live with what you're left with. I'm not ashamed to say, I've had two nervous breakdowns since he died. I've been to, in two psych hospitals because I couldn't hit, handle what I saw. My child was gray and ice cold. He looked like a mannequin, <clears throat> covered in blood and vomit. And this was a person who was larger than life. He was six foot ten. And one pill, little pill, could kill him. What could it do to the average size person? I don't want my life for anybody else. My daughter lost her brother. My husband. I have two stepsons, they lost their brother. My son's friends, they didn't learn. Four of them died since. But I don't want another mother feeling awful, feeling what I feel. Because my life, as I know it, is over. I struggle to get out of bed every day. I live on antidepressants. Half of me is gone. It's not like when you lose a parent. I've lost a parent. You lose a child. Half of you is gone. Part of you is gone. And I'll never get it back. And everything he told me was a lie. And everything Joe told me was gonna happen, did. And as much as you don't want to believe and you don't want to hear what he has to say, he knows. He said to me, he's a ticking time bomb. And he was. And when I last, when I had spoken to Joe, it was just a couple of days before, um, he was going away. And he called my sister and said, how was your nephew? She said, I'm very good Saturday. He said, it's too late. And it was. And all the signs are there. All the signs were there. And if, if, you're, if you're doing drugs, you deserve life. My son's life is over. He's never going to get married. He's never going to have children. He's never going to go to his sister's wedding let alone his own. He misses, my niece just had a baby, he missed it. He misses everything. And we miss him. And everything is ruined because he's not there. The silence in my house is deafening. But nobody wants the life. <coughs> nobody wants to be the mother of kid who died of drug overdose, not because of shame,
but because of the pain he left behind. Because it didn't have to happen. He needed rehab. And he was afraid of it. So he chose death instead. But he always thought he had one more day. And you don't. You don't. People think they look at these rock stars and they've been doing drugs for 20 years. It's not like that anymore. Drugs are different. They're made to kill you and kill you quick. And you never know which pill you take is going to stop your heart. My son's heart exploded. And that's what these pills are made to do. They're made to kill you. That's why I'm here to tell his story, because I don't want it to happen to anyone else. Thank you for listening.